NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. Well, thanks so much, Jeff, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, actually, I always do want people to mention my book uh, called Race to Incarcerate. Uh, the reason is because uh, it's important to get these things right. Uh, when the book was first published, I was giving a talk uh, in Washington, one of the bookstores, and a newsletter went out promoting the talk and said Mark Mal will speak about his new book, Race to Incinerate. <laughs> so, <laughs> Those issues are important too, but I think we want to talk about prisons here today. Um, I'm delighted all the energy in the room. I was just saying uh, how much I've learned myself over this last day and a half or so already, so it's really been very engaging. Um, you know, when I work with defense attorneys around issues of race and sentencing, uh, here's one typical way it plays out. Uh, I get a call from a defense attorney. It's usually around 5 in the afternoon. Uh, and the person says, you know, I've got a client coming up for sentencing. My client is a young black man. Uh, I want to present some data to the judge, uh, talk about the situation of African-American men in incarceration and the like, and wonder if you could help me. Uh, and I said, sure, I'd be happy to do it. I say, uh, when's your sentencing coming up? And there's a little pause. Uh, well, it's 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I give them, you know, some of the data, quick stuff that they can use and plug into their sentencing argument. Uh, and then I always close and say, uh, you know what, give me a call after the sentencing hearing. You know, just tell me how it goes and all that. Uh, and they never call back. So uh, this tells me two things. One, uh, I think you need to start preparing for sentencing before the night before this uh, hearing in court, right? Two, uh, a number or two by itself without the right context and without connecting to the individual uh, is probably not going to take us too far. So that's what we need to be thinking about. So I want to talk a little bit about what we know about from the research, from policy and practice about race and sensing, how these issues play out. Uh, let me start with a quick story about a friend of mine. Uh, my friend and his wife are the parents to three teenage kids, two girls and a boy. Uh, and a couple of years ago, their teenage son started acting like a teenage boy. So he was staying out late at night, he was smashing up the family car once in a while, his grades were suffering in school, there may have been some drinking and drug use going on. It was nothing terrible, but my uh, friends were concerned about this, what was happening. And then one night they get a call from the police. Uh, their son's just been picked up uh, for larceny from the local 7-Eleven store. Could they come down to the police station, pick him up? So they go down there, and over the course of the next couple of weeks, uh, they're in conversations with first the initial arresting officer and then the prosecutor assigned to the case. Uh, and what they said to them was, you know, our son's been having problems. We know it. He knows it. We've identified a social worker who we think can help him through this stage. He's amenable to meeting with the social worker. And the prosecutor basically said, you know, that sounds like a good plan. It's his first arrest. We don't want him to go any deeper into the system. That makes sense. So let's dismiss the charges and you have him work with the social worker. So they go off and indeed he works with the social worker for a number of months and things start to straighten out and he looks like he's heading for a nice middle class lifestyle for whatever he may choose. Now on the same evening my friend's son was picked up, I would imagine not very far away, another kid was picked up for the same offense, uh, but he may not have been fortunate enough to have parents who had the resources to get a private social worker or the negotiating skills to deal with a prosecutor in the case. Now, he's not gonna go to prison on his first shoplifting offense, of course. You know, he may get a fine or have to do some community service. But six months from now, he gets picked up for another larceny or break into a car or burglary or something like that. And all of a sudden, he starts to look like one of these habitual offenders as we define them in the law and he starts going down a very different path than my friend's son seems to be going down. 
So when we talk about race and justice, we're talking about, I think, the intersection of race, social class, poverty, the justice system. We're talking about access to resources that we think of public safety as the justice system when actually public safety takes place in many different dimensions. And those of us who are fortunate enough to have resources, we can deal with public safety in ways that never have to enter the justice system. So that's, I think, uh, the big picture we want to keep in mind. Uh, if we look at the data, the overall data, we go back a little over a half century. Uh, 1954, the year of the Brown decision. Uh, on the day of the Brown decision, there were about 100,000 African Americans behind bars in this country, 100,000. Over the course of the next half century, we had opening up of social and economic opportunity for many people to whom that had previously been denied. If you look in the criminal justice system, it's not at all unusual to see people of color in important leadership positions in the courts and corrections and the like. And yet, despite all this progress, we see the number of African Americans behind bars, 100,000, is now more than 700,000. So how do we explain this seeming contradiction between real progress in many areas of society, and yet we look at the criminal justice system, incarceration, it's immeasurably worse than it was uh, uh, on the day of the Brown decision. Well, for some people, uh, they would say, well, this is merely just uh, an issue of crime rates. If you do the crime, you do the time. Some groups of people are more likely to commit crimes than others, and that's the way it is. You end up in prison if you commit a crime. And we do know that if you look at arrest rates, which is about the closest measure we have, uh, African Americans are arrested for certain kinds of crimes disproportionate to their numbers in the population. About 30% for property crimes, about 40% for violent crimes compared to their 13% share of the national population. Uh, but we don't have to dig very deep to see what might be interpreted by some as a race effect is really one of social class. It's poverty, it's concentrated poverty, all the disadvantages in life that come along with that that help us to understand what's going on. Uh, so crime rates, in one sense, tell us something about disparities, but we also know that policy and practice decisions what kind of policies we enact, what kind of resources we put in different parts of the system, how is decision making done in the system, at every level of the system, very much contribute to these outcomes as well. Uh, if we look at sentencing research, uh, you know, the most Heavily studied areas, the death penalty, of course, you know, going back to the boldest study in the McCleskey case in the mid 1980s, where it was shown very definitively that killing a white person, you had four times the chance of receiving a death sentence as if you killed a black person. There have been scores of studies since then, all essentially coming up with the same conclusions. Uh, if we look at non-capital cases, there's been no shortage of research there too. The research is a little more complicated there, but nonetheless shows undeniable racial effects. What we see is it's race in conjunction with other factors. It's race and gender, it's race and employment issues and the like. And if you tease it out that way, that's what the best findings are. Um, but there's some drawbacks in some of the sentencing research. You know, typically, a lot of these studies will go into the courtroom and say, okay, we've got a black person convicted of burglary, a white person convicted of burglary, let's measure their sentences and see if they're the same or not. Uh, and that's fine to do that. The problem is we know that there's a series of decisions made at different stages of the system long before we get into court on the day of sentencing that very much influence who's in court, what they're charged with, what they're convicted of. Uh, we know, of course, that implicit bias that affects all of us growing up in a racist society certainly affects criminal justice practitioners as well. Uh, just a couple of examples of how this plays out. 
uh, study in juvenile detention in Multnomah County, Oregon, basically a city of Portland, uh, was looking at, again, risk assessment criteria we've talked about this morning to make the determination of which kids need to be detained and which ones could go home. Uh, and when they looked at the criteria, one of them was, does the young person have a, quote, good family structure? Um, well, some of us are fortunate to be brought into life with a good family structure, and some of us are not so fortunate to have that, but we're making decisions on liberty based on that amount of luck. So they changed uh, that criterion, uh, rather than a good family structure, to is there a responsible adult who can look after this young person if he's released? Responsible adult might be a teacher, might be a minister, might be a sports coach, somebody else in the community, but if the idea is oversight, making sure that the young person appears in court for trial, uh, you want a responsible adult here. They made that change, racial disparities in release decisions reduced dramatically, just from a very simple change like that. Another uh, study, uh, also among juveniles, uh, this was a statewide study which basically looked at the pre-sentence report prepared by probation officers make determinations about uh, placement after conviction. Uh, what the researchers did was they looked at the narrative section of the report from the officers. Basically, the probation officers' subjective assessment of who this kid was and, and what they're all about and what their potential might be. For the white kids, they tended to be described as having environmental problems. In other words, they weren't getting along well with, with their family, uh, their grades weren't doing very well in school, they're occasionally getting into fights at school, things like that. The black kids were more likely to be defined as having an antisocial personality. Now, what's the implication here? Well, if we're talking about environmental factors, there are things we could try to do about that, right? We could bring a counselor in to work with the family on their family dynamics. We could bring tutors in to help academically at school. Uh, we have peer group work done in the high school, things like that. None of this is a magic bullet, but we know that there are interventions that can be successful in, with these kinds of problems. If somebody on the other end is defined as having an antisocial personality, we can't give them a new personality, right? So the judge thinking about public safety grounds and things like that uh, may err on the side of continued detention someplace or other based on dangerousness criteria, things like that. So we see decision making uh, I think it's important to note uh, there's no reason to believe this is being done in a consciously racist way. The outcomes clearly are quite racist and their implications. Uh, we see this very much playing out in sentencing policy as well. Uh, at the federal level, you know, the whole uh, debate and uh, engagement around mandatory sensing, federal drug offenses, you know, broadly critiqued. Uh, the most recent report from the U.S. Sensing Commission looking at mandatory sensing in the federal system, 2011, uh, basically looking at the role of the prosecutor here. Uh, so first, of course, we find, you know, the, the big secret that, you know, mandatory sentencing, in fact, is not always mandatory. Uh, don't tell that to any legislators. You know, they think that uh, this is the way it's done. Uh, man, it's not always mandatory because we have prosecutors making decisions about charging. And what the commission found was that the white defendants were much more likely to be allowed to plead to an offense that did not carry a mandatory, even though they could have been charged with a mandatory, much more likely than were the black defendants being allowed to plead to a case like that. So we see how this plays out in some of the decision making. We also have, you know, in terms of public policy broadly, uh, a whole set of uh, policies that on the surface could be described as race neutral, 
that play out in very predictable racial ways producing racial disparities. Uh, you know, probably the most high profile of these were the crack cocaine penalties passed by Congress in 1986. Um, you know, there's nothing in the legislation that says the intent of this legislation is to lock up young black men and put them in prison for long periods of time, nor is there any evidence that members of Congress were meeting in a back room saying, how can we write a uh, sentencing law that will incarcerate young black men in large numbers? Uh, but we do know, though, that the face, the image of the crack cocaine user or seller in 1986 was clearly that of a young black man. That may or may not have been the case in reality, but that was clearly the public image of the so-called problem, and of course the predictable uh, outcomes took place immediately. The laws were passed. 80% of the people charged with these offenses turned out to be African American, which continues to this day. Uh, but it's not only the crack cocaine laws, a whole set of other policies, very similar dynamics too. Um, every state has some type of drug-free school zone policy where, you know, uh, drug offenses committed near a school zone uh, are subject to enhanced penalties. Uh, and, you know, you draw a radius around the school zone, uh, that defines where, uh, where the penalties will be applied. Uh, there are some cases, some states have drawn the radius around the school as much as three miles from the school. Uh, it's hard to imagine the intent of the uh, drug seller and the drug transaction two and a half miles away that they realize they're in a school zone, but apparently that's what they're doing. Um, so why, why do we see a racial effect from drug-free school zone laws? Well, it has to do with housing patterns, density, and the like. Uh, people of color are disproportionately located in urban communities. Urban communities are very densely populated. Uh, in many large cities, you'd be hard pressed to find a single block that's not within a school zone. If it's defined as 500 feet, 700 feet from the school, something like that. Uh, in many cases, the school zone laws apply to a drug transaction held in the middle of the night by consenting adults that happens to be near the school zone when all the kids in the school are home sleeping. It still could be prosecuted that way. So if we see a drug offense in urban area, far more likely to be subject to penalties in a rural suburban area, far less likely, and the racial dynamics play out there very cleanly. Uh, New Jersey, some years ago, seeing these patterns on the ground, the study was done, 96% of the people charged with a school zone enhancement were African American or Latino. Uh, the legislature, to its credit, then scaled back the severity of the law, gave judges more discretion in some of the school zone cases. We see it as well, uh, race-neutral effects in the whole range of uh, laws, uh, habitual offender laws, three strikes in your out laws, and the like. Uh, and the challenge here is uh, to look at how do we use a uh, prior criminal record in terms of sentencing for a current offense. Uh, the fact is, if we look at two defendants coming to court for sentencing, a black defendant and a white defendant, the black defendant, on average, is more likely to have a prior criminal record. Now, some people think that's because of greater engagement in crime. Some people think that's because of racist policing tactics. Uh, whatever one may think, we do know that statistically black defendants are more likely to have a prior record than whites. Now we have habitual offender laws that are premised on punishing prior criminal records more harshly. Uh, we see it in California with the three strikes and you're out law. About 30% of the prison population is African American. If you look at the people serving time for a three strikes offense, it's about 40% there. Now, we've had habitual offender laws for many decades, and we can debate the wisdom of them, but what's changed in recent decades, and by three strikes laws and other policies, is 
the scale of the impact of those prior convictions. You know, it might have been the case in the past that your first burglary conviction, you're subject to two years in prison, your second one is four years. Now with three strikes and you're out, uh, what might have been a burglary of a few years now becomes 25 to life, 50 to life in some cases as well. So we see a much more substantial impact as it plays out uh, at sentencing. Uh, it's a very interesting case some years ago. Some of you may be familiar with it. Uh, Nancy Gertner, when she was on the federal bench in Boston, uh, the case called Levener, uh, <clears throat> this was an African-American man who uh, lived in Boston, was driving around in Boston one night, was stopped by the police, and they found a gun in the car. He was charged with uh, weapons possession. Uh, case came out, he was convicted, the case came up for sentencing. Uh, Judge Gertner looked at his prior record and how that affected the sentencing guidelines, and she found that he had several priors that basically resulted from police stops. He was driving around, the police stopped him, they found drugs in the car. Driving around, the police stopped him, they found a gun in the car, and now they found another weapon, this time two. So under the sentencing guidelines, based on the offense and his prior record, uh, he was looking at six years in prison. Judge Gertner departed downward, sentenced him to two and a half years in prison, and her rationale was that she didn't contest the validity of those prior convictions, but basically said as an African-American man driving around in Boston, he is more likely to be stopped than a white man driving around in Boston, and therefore more likely to acquire a more substantial criminal record over time. So in effect, she discounted some of that prior record due to racist policing tactics. Uh, intriguing way to think about uh, how do we incorporate this, what can you do in terms of making sentencing arguments and the like. So we see how some of these policies, uh, again, race neutral on the surface, having very predictable racial effects. Um, so how does this come about? Uh, there's very interesting um, perception research looking at how do people process information, how do they act on information and the like. Uh, one series of studies looks at uh, <clears throat> how do people perceive race and crime. And essentially what a number of studies find is that uh, if you ask people to estimate the proportion of a certain crime that's committed by African Americans, that white respondents overestimate that proportion by a substantial amount, uh, as much as 20 or 30% over and above what the numbers uh, would actually indicate. So we see an overperception of the black involvement in crime. Uh, then if you measure support for punishment, uh, if you say to people for this and such and such a crime, with this prior record, you know, how much punishment should we impose on a person? What you find is that to the degree that white respondents identify a certain crime as a, quote, black crime, there's greater support for punishment that emerges there, too. So first, a misperception of actual crime rates by certain racial groups to the extent that they misperceive that greater support for punishment. So these are uh, polling studies. Uh, we see these outcomes are white respondents. Uh, most legislators in this country are white. I don't think there's any reason to believe let white legislators process this information differently than white respondents, broadly speaking. So what's going on in people's minds? How do they think about the issues? How do they think about some of these problems? Okay, so what, what can we do about this? Um, <clears throat> what are some ways that people are thinking about trying to address this? Uh, of course, you know, again, implicit bias, training and oversight and the like uh, is uh, more understood now, the need for it, uh, still pretty limited in what it's been able to do. We clearly need much better data, oversight, and analysis. Uh, you know, the only good thing you can say about 
policing these days and racial profiling is that at least now in a number of jurisdictions we have real data we can go into court we can go in the court of public opinion and talk about it uh, police departments that say it's they have a few bad apples and that's the issue okay let's get the data and look at it. if it's a few bad apples we deal with a few bad apples if it's more pervasive we have a bigger problem how do we deal with that um, policy development, you know, how do we incorporate uh, thinking about some of these racial effects as we're thinking about sentencing policy. Uh, at the Sensing Project, we've been very involved in a number of states uh, in promoting a legislative concept of racial impact statement legislation. Uh, this is very similar to fiscal impact statements, environmental impact statements. Essentially, the understanding that when we enact significant policies, there are often unintended consequences. We should try to anticipate what those consequences may be, whether they're fiscal consequences, environmental consequences. We should try to do that in advance so we can avoid uh, making mistakes in that area. So for racial impact statements, legislation on criminal justice policies, you know, how could we have avoided the crack cocaine penalties in Congress in 1986? Well, it seems to me, uh, rather than racing through that legislation in record time, we should have had a healthy discussion about the potential impact of the policies. Now, I don't know that that would have changed the outcome, but we should at least get it on the record, have the conversation, give all relevant parties a chance to air the issues, and think about, you know, are there ways to deal with a drug problem that don't involve exacerbating the racial disparities we already see? So several states have adopted racial impact statement legislation in recent years. Iowa, Connecticut, Oregon, New Jersey's on the cusp of doing it right now too. Uh, this is not gonna change the world uh, and it's only uh, uh, for prospective policy decisions, new legislation moving forward, uh, but it seems to me it's the kind of process we'd want to see looking at our it, sentencing policies, broadly speaking. Why do we go back and take a look, and are there so-called unintended consequences that we might uncover? Uh, finally, I think, you know, we need to level the playing field. If we're talking about the overlap of race and class and producing disparate outcomes, uh, access to resources, how do we start to think about that? Uh, bail, bond issues clearly is a major part of that. Uh, more funding for the defense, how do we deal with expert witnesses, how do we have greater variety of alternatives to incarcerations, options to present to judges and the like, all these kinds of things that continue to perpetuate a two-tiered system of justice. Um, let me just close with one, um, one image that I think uh, unfortunately had been very uh, powerful in recent years. Uh, you'll recall probably in the mid-90s, um, a small group of high-profile commentators coined a new term to talk about what they saw as a coming crime wave. And they identify this coming crime wave as coming from super predators. Super predators, right? Uh, and what they were talking about basically was a group of young black boys. Uh, and the predictions were they would be more out of control, more jobless, more valueless than any group of young people we'd ever seen in history. And we better get ready for this coming crime wave. Uh, uh, and they were very influential. You know, they had op-eds on the pages of the Wall Street Journal. You can see Hillary Clinton using the term back in the mid-90s. She subsequently apologized for doing so. Uh, it became part of this, you know, tough on crime era with the image of black boys at the center of the piece. Now, there are a couple of problems they had. One is that they weren't very good social scientists because almost as soon as they came up with this term, crime rates started to decline. Um, I don't think it declined because of their term, but they did start to decline for adults and juveniles alike and for black, white, Latino juveniles alike as well. So crime rates were declining. They clearly were not very good social scientists in what they were looking at. 
But you know, think about it for a moment. Uh, suppose we had some legitimate social science today that suggested that there was a group of five-year-old boys who 10 years from now would be completely out of control and we had this coming crime wave uh, that we we're gonna have to deal with. How would we respond to such research if we had that? Well, it seems to me we have two choices, basically. The first option would be to say, let's build as many prisons as we can so we have lots of space to keep these kids locked up for a long period of time. The second option is to say, well, you know, the only good news here is that we have a 10-year window of opportunity, 10 years to try to do something to scale down the, uh, what this crime wave looks like. So what kind of interventions do we need to do with families, with communities, in our social policy, our economic policy, to try to make a difference in the lives of these young children? So which one do we choose? Well, it seems to me far too often when we define crime as somebody else's kid, someone else's community, we end up choosing the first option. Build prisons, lock them up. We've dealt with the problem that way. When it's our own children or children we can identify with, we're all much more likely to say the second option. We can solve this problem. We can throw money at problems. We can deal with this issue. Let's do it in a compassionate way. So it seems to me what we need to be doing is to think about how do we create a political environment where we view all children as our children, and we do that collectively. We can do that, then I think we have a much better outcome for public safety, but we have a much healthier society as well. Thank you very much.